But one thing you see at the beginning of the Bible and at the end of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So in the very beginning of this book, we see that the Holy Spirit is there. And one of the last verses in this book, it says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. I wrote a book on just the first few verses of the book of Genesis. And in that, there are nine steps that God can take you to fulfill what you were put on this earth to do. And it doesn't really matter what it is. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. In the beginning, number one, you have to start with God. I'm not taking you down this. I'm not going to preach on this. But I simply want to show you just nine quick things that have to do that God does in every person's life. If you want to put... Be the person that God put you on this earth to be. God didn't put you on this earth so you could just roam around and do nothing. Like Julie just said, God put you on this earth for an assignment and he put you on this earth to solve a problem. Most people never know why they were put on this earth to do. And so they never solve the problem. They asked Mother Teresa once, how come there's not been a cure for AIDS? How come nobody has come up with a cure? She said somebody did have the cure, but you aborted them. Every person on this earth was put on this earth with an assignment. And if you want to know what that is, you can't decide what that is. Yeah. You know, I, I just, somebody was talking about sex trafficking, and so I just thought I'd get involved in that. No, you don't get to decide that. Your assignment, you have to discover it. Because yeah. mm -hmm. if you try to do something in the flesh, it's going to fail. Yeah. The greatest tragedy is to be successful at the wrong assignment. You have to start with God. When you start with God, God begins to create things in you. He's a creator. There was a study done of about 2,000 kids starting at the age of five. What they found was at the age of five, 98% of these kids had creativity in them. They were creative. They did the survey again when they turned 10. But now only 30% of them were creative. They tested them again at 15 years old, and only 10% of them were creative. What they learned is that in those 10 years, 9 out of 10 of them stopped being creative, and that non-creative behavior is learned behavior. They surveyed about 200,000 adults. And it was only 2% were created. God creates. When you say yes to Jesus Christ, there's a creator that is put on the inside of you. There's a five-year-old kid locked up inside of you that wants to be creative, to solve problems, to be a problem solver. But we've suppressed him so much. I really wonder if when Jesus, when the disciples came to Jesus and said, who is the greatest? And he took a kid. I wonder if he took a five-year-old kid and said, unless you become like this five-year-old kid, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Now what God creates in you is formless and void. It's empty. It's like a planter. There's nothing in that. If you go to Lowe's right now, Home Depot, whatever, garden store you want to, and you buy a planter, there's nothing in it. If you don't buy the soil, the rock, whatever, the plants, anything to put in there, it remains empty. You have to do something with it. God creates it. You say, well, how big is the thing he's creating in me? Well, that depends how far you want to go with it. Because the Spirit of God is hovering over that which he created. I wouldn't have thought, now I understand we're in a building now, but normally we're in a tent. I wouldn't have thought in a million years I'd be in a tent. I thought you lost your ever-loving mind. But all of a sudden I saw tents across America and God said, how can you stay? Don't ask God, how can I go? Ask God, how can I stay? 
So you start with God. God begins to create something in you. That creation doesn't have anything there, but the Holy Spirit is hovering over it. And then God speaks a word. He speaks a word to you. And that word has life in it. And if you allow that word and the Holy Spirit that's hovering over it to come into agreement in your life, it will create life within you. And what God brings forth is always good. God's not going to create something in you that's like ugly, nasty, deformed. He creates good. And then he separates the light from the darkness. We talked about this this morning. The Holy Spirit comes and he convicts of sin and righteousness. He creates a dividing line of what is wrong and what is right. And then God finally calls us to dominion. He gives us authority over everything the devil can come against you with. And he will come. There are plenty of times the devil comes. But you have authority. But if you don't know this right here, the devil will just run over you. That's right. Well, I can't understand why I keep getting hit upside the head with a two by four from the devil. <laughs> well, you don't know what the word of God says. <coughs> this is why what I do is I'll push the word of God out in front of me and then I'll hide behind it. So if you don't like what I say, it's not me that you're upset with. It's the word of God. Now, if I'm spouting off my own opinion and you don't like that, you have every right to not like me. Jesus comes to John the Baptist in Matthew 3, and it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to, Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But John had just said, I'm not the one you're looking for, but one is coming after me who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. So when Jesus comes and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he wants that baptism. He wants the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He wants the baptism of fire. But that's not why Jesus came. John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. He never gets the taste of this. The things that you have the ability to taste right now, everybody from Genesis, from, from the very beginning, all the way to John the Baptist, desired this, wanted this, and they never got to taste it. And we do, and we sit around, and we do nothing with it. And this is what they long for. They long to see Jesus. They long to be a part. That doesn't mean they didn't have the Holy Spirit, because they did. But it was a little bit different. Jesus said, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. What's really interesting is that the baptism of John was a baptism of repentance. Last time I checked, Jesus was sinless. Yeah. Why would he need a baptism of repentance? I don't know either. But he was doing it because the father told him to because he said, I don't do anything that the father doesn't show me to do. So he's walking in obedience. If you want the power of the Holy Spirit operating in your life, then you have to be a person of obedience. Yes. What happens when he obeys? When Jesus was baptized, immediately when he went up from the water, behold, the heavens were opened to him. How many of you ever heard the scripture? I believe it's in Isaiah. Oh God, that you would rent the heavens and come down. That's it. Right there is the fulfillment of that prophecy by Isaiah. Because this isn't a little, oh look, the clouds parted and the sun came out. No, this is a ripping open of heaven and the Holy Spirit coming down. God rented the heavens and came down. And then he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then immediately he's led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and for 40 nights he fasted. Now I don't know if you've all ever fasted before for an extended period of time. I've never done a 40 day fast. 
I have no plans to do a 40-day fast. There's only three people in the entire word of God that did a 40-day fast. Every one of them was supernatural. Moses was up on a mountain for 80 days. No food, no water. Elijah is running from his life, gets fed by some angels, and then he, he goes for 40 days, sustained on that. Jesus is in the wilderness, 110 degrees in the shade, no water. I'm going to do a 40-day fast. You better make sure God talked to you. Because these are supernatural events that happen. But guess who comes when you're at your weakest point? The devil shows up. And he begins to tempt you. And he begins to do things. But what did Jesus fight every time with? The word of God. Even when the devil came and said, it is written. Jesus said, that's great, but you misquoted it. Let me show you how this works. But what happened before all that? The Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Now, many people think that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit started on the day of Pentecost. Unfortunately, it did not. There are evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Now, it is a rarity, and it didn't happen very often. But it says in Ezekiel 2, 2, And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me, set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Ezekiel 3, 24. But the Spirit entered into me, set me on my feet, and he spoke with me, and he said, Go shut yourself within the house. Judges 6, 34. But the Spirit of Jehovah clothed Gideon. So the Spirit of God put Gideon on like clothing. And he sounded the trumpet. One man who had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit could take 300 men and chase an entire army out. God is only looking for one person that will say enough is enough. And there's no demon in hell that can stop you. 2 Chronicles 24 and 20. Then the Spirit of God clothed Zechariah, the son of Jehoda, Jehoda, the priest. That sounds good enough to me. I always try to say those names like I know what I'm talking about, even if I butcher it real bad and I still... <laughs> then it made me you know, like, oh, I didn't know that was the way it was pronounced. And, you know. Now the majority of the time in the Old Testament... The Holy Spirit would come upon a person. Those are the only four evidences within the entire scripture of Genesis to Malachi that the Holy Spirit dwelt inside of an individual. But we see a lot of the Holy Spirit coming on a person. Isaiah 11, 2, And the Spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Well, I just don't know what to do. You need the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of wisdom. He's the Spirit of revelation. He's the Spirit of knowledge. When you don't know what to do, well, I don't know. Should I go do this? He's the Spirit of counsel. You can have sawdust for brains. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit and make it in this world. If you have the Holy Spirit, everything you need is at your disposal. I don't care what they told you in school. I don't care what they told you when you were growing up. I don't care what they told you at your job, that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, that you'll never amount to anything. The Holy Spirit changes the entire equation in your life. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. And the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because God has appoint, anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. This is what the Spirit of God does to you. The Spirit of God, when He anoints you to bring good news to the poor. I don't know about you, but if I was poor, you know what good news would be to me? Money. Money. The Holy Spirit anoints you and he brings prosperity in your life. Not so you can build yourself up, but that you can help others. Yeah. I don't know why anybody is against the prosperity message. I'm not talking about selfishness. If you're thinking that, well, he just wants money for himself. No! I gave everything. I Everything I have, 
I've given to go after people to win souls into the kingdom of God. Why? Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. I'm not saying everybody has to do that. That's what I've done. The Holy Spirit comes into your life to bind up the brokenhearted. Is there anybody in here that's had their heart broken before? Well, the Holy Spirit comes to cleanse you of that, to purify you of that. He takes something that's been shattered into a thousand pieces and he brings it all together and makes something whole and beautiful. Now, if you weren't here this morning, then you missed that everything I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are twins. Everything the Holy Spirit does is because he's doing what Jesus would have done if Jesus was still here. So really, you can interchange them. When Jesus comes into your life, he anoints you for prosperity. When Jesus comes into your life, he binds up your broken heart. The Spirit of God comes to proclaim liberty to the captives. I've seen that time and time again. People come, they're so bound up. They don't even know what to do. They're bound up in fear. They're bound up. We had a young lady right out here. So bound up in fear. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God hit her. She started slapping the guy next to him. Because she didn't even know what to do. Because God was proclaiming liberty to her as a captive. You know what it was? It was peace. She was in so much chaos, she didn't even know what to do with herself. To open of the prison to those who are bound. Here's the thing. Almost everybody I know that really wants Jesus, they don't think they can, they're in a prison cell. And they've made it really nice They've made a nice bed for themselves. They maybe have painted it the colors they wanted, got the furniture they wanted, thought they're, they're in the cell, so I just must, I better make the best of it. But yet the bars have been open the entire time and all they had to do was leave. And it isn't until somebody comes and tells them, by the Holy Spirit, that the prison's been opened and you can walk out. Because someday soon, that prison door is going to slam and it'll be too late to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God I get people all the time because I warn people about hell you don't want to go there why are you trying to make people have fear I'm not I'm telling them that there's a reality when they die that it's heaven or hell but you've got to make your choice while you're on this earth There is a heaven to gain, and there is a hell to shun. And hell is a place of eternal torment, night and day, day and night. It never ends. You will never find relief. You do not want to go there. This continues throughout even the Gospels. We see the Spirit of God coming and resting on people. But then something happens in the book of Acts. And we see a dramatic shift happen. The prophet Yoel, or for us English people, Joel, spoke. Peter quotes him on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. And I mentioned this this morning that he, will, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. At this point, we go from almost every instance of it resting upon people and not in people to a complete reversal that from this point forward, you almost never, I don't think, I can't think of one time where at this point and beyond, it ever talks about something, the Holy Spirit resting on somebody. It's always the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit allows the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to you and through you. Which is why you see one of the first evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Because the Holy Spirit is praying for you. 
But every instant that I said in the Old Testament where there was the indwelling, the Holy Spirit indwelt them so that they could speak the word of God. You have the ability with the Holy Spirit, if he is indwelling in you, that you can have the power of the Holy Spirit and have the language of the Holy Spirit, which is the language of heaven. You know how I can tell most people don't know that they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? By the words that come out of their mouth. Hey, how are you doing today? Well, you know, my sciatic is acting up. My back's really hurting. Uh, my knees are in a lot of pain. Keep talking like that. You'll be dead by next week. Because every word that comes out of your mouth is a prophecy. I heard probably the pastor of the largest church in the world today. He said, every word, both good and bad, to come out of your mouth, the moment you release it, the angels grab a hold of it and get to work. You better be careful what you're speaking. Jeremiah, they all got mad. And they're like, you know, the burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord. He said, don't you dare to say that my word is a burden. He said the burden is that every word that's coming out of your mouth is negative and you're prophesying doom and gloom on yourself and that's the burden, not my word. Jesus was the word and he said my burden, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In 1 Samuel 16, As I just mentioned, that obedience is a catalyst for the Holy Spirit in your life. Disobedience does the direct opposite. Samuel, the prophet, told Saul, this is what you're supposed to do. Slaughter everything. Nothing left alive. Samuel comes. Saul goes, I did everything like you told me. And Samuel goes, well, then what's the bleeding of sheep that I hear? Oh, well, I saved those for sacrifice to the Lord. He says, you think God needs that? He says, I want obedience more than sacrifice. And because of that disobedience, in 1 Samuel 16, 14, it says, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. One act of a disobedience. And if you were here this morning, go read Acts 5 if you think that's New Te or Old Testament only. That's all I'm going to say with that. The other thing that can happen with the Holy Spirit is there's a transfer that can happen. Look, he gives the Holy Spirit without measure. The only person that can limit the Holy Spirit in your life is you. As a matter of fact, this guy right here can have more of the Holy Spirit per square inch than I can because he's smaller. God told Moses, he said that he would take some of the spirit off Moses and put it on others. And then he did it in Numbers 11, verse 17 and in chapter 25. The Holy Spirit would come on people and they would begin to prophesy. I was in a church service once. On the front row, this young man leans over. He gives me a word. I knew it was from God. I didn't like the kid, to be really honest, because I knew he had secret sin in his life. I caught him too many times. Turns out he did. Left the church, living with... He's married to another man. But yet he gave me a word, and it was from God. Saul, coming to kill David, comes into the presence of God and begins to prophesy. And then they begin to think Saul is a prophet too. This says, why? Just because somebody gives you a word, keep the focus on who the word's from, yeah. not the person. Yeah. Debbie gave me a word this morning if you were here. Was it right on? It was. Doesn't tell me anything about Debbie. Well, other than I knew she heard from God. <laughs> but it tells me a whole lot about God knows where I'm at. <laughs> Though I do trust her. There's absolutely nothing. I was in a church service once. <laughs> First time I ever went there. 
God spoke to me and he said in the prayer time before, he said, there's a snake in this church. I said, I don't want to hear any more, God. I don't want to hear any more. I don't want to hear any more. He said, well, that's good because every day, every Sunday, he slithers in or she slithers in. They slither in. They slither out. They think nobody knows, but the Holy Spirit knows. There is nothing that is hidden from the Holy Spirit. Psalm 139 and 7. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If you think that in the secrecy of your home, you are hidden from the Holy Spirit and your activities on what you do on YouTube, what you do on the computer, what you watch on TV, what you allow through your eye gate, through your ear gate, those things. And you think that the Holy Spirit doesn't know. Oh, he knows. He knows. The Holy Spirit is a gatherer. He brings things in. Isaiah 34, 16 says, Seek. And read from the book of the Lord. Not one of these shall be missing. None shall be without her mate. For the mouth of the Lord has commanded. And his spirit has gathered them. I believe that the Holy Spirit brought every animal to Noah on the ark. Noah didn't go and get them. They all came to him. Now you say why would you say that? You said earlier, that's your opinion. I cannot like you because of it. Well, let me read just something real quick and then you can make your decision. In Genesis 7, 15, it says this. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. Why is that important? Because the Holy Spirit is referred to in the Old Testament as breath or a wind. I believe what, what you see is God took some dirt. He began to shape Adam. He began to form his legs and everything. Got him all done. And all he was was a clump of dirt. There wasn't no organs in there. He was dirt. But then God went, and everything came to life. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was a seed for what we read in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Then Jesus comes along and he breathes on his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. This is what happens to you at salvation. When you say yes to Jesus Christ, Jesus, in a sense, breathes on you, you receive the Holy Spirit. What does that do? It gives you the ability to live a holy life. It gives you ability to do what it says, I believe in Galatians, where the fruit of the Spirit are. You now have the ability to do that. But that doesn't mean you have any power. I know a lot of people whose character is flawless. They are great and wonderful people, but they have no power. On the flip side, I know a lot of people that claim to walk in power, but my God in heaven, I wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. I know people that have world-renowned ministries, and I wouldn't spend five minutes in the same room with them. Maybe I'm the problem. I'm willing to accept that. But the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit are two separate events. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is when God decides for you, because you said yes, to introduce you into the school of power. It is just the beginning. I'm not going to get into the baptism of the Holy Spirit tonight, but I'm telling you, you have to have it in this day and age in which we live. God expected every believer to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit when they got saved. It was salvation through Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus alone. And then immediately pivot and be water baptized and be Holy Spirit baptized. That's the way it was designed. This is why when Philip goes down to Samaria and they're having salvation signs, wonders, miracle, joy has hit the city because of all that God is doing. But there's no outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Word reaches Peter and John in Jerusalem. 
When they hear that there's been no outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they immediately go to Samaria and begin to pray for the people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Same thing happened in Acts 19. Paul's talking to a couple men. said, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believe? They said, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Why? Because of a lack of teaching. Nobody taught them. This is the day and age in which we live in. We just want good sound bites. Give me something good that I can post on the internet that doesn't mean a licking thing or anything that can help somebody, but daggone it sounds good and I sound spiritual. That's right. Unless you come across somebody who actually knows the word of God and then you sound like an idiot. Back that up. You sound like a uh, person that doesn't know the word of God. Thank you. <laughs> You see, the, the Father would speak and the Holy Spirit would carry it out. In 1 Chronicles 14, and the Philistine yet again made a raid in the valley. And when David again inquired of God, God said to him, You shall go, you shall not go up after them. Go around and come against them, opposite of the balsam tree. And when you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then go to battle. For God has gone before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. How many of you have ever heard the wind? If you can hear the wind, you can hear the Holy Spirit. He begins to blow. He begins to blow. The Holy Spirit delivered this entire thing right here. Zechariah 7, 12. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words of God, the Lord of hosts, had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profited. There's that word breathed again. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. The Holy Spirit and the word of God will always agree. If you think, well, the Holy Spirit told me this. If it's in violation of the word of God, the Holy Spirit didn't tell that to you. Zechariah 4. And the angel who talked with him came again and woke me, like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. You always wonder why he's got to repeat that twice. He came to me and woke, woke me up, like a man who was woken out of his sleep. He said to me, What do you see? I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand of all gold, with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it, and with the seven lips of each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there were two olive trees by it. One on the right bow and another on the left. And I said to the angel who talked to me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked to me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? No, I just decided to ask the question, you know, to see if you were really here listening to me. I just, sorry. This is the way my mind works. I'm sorry. That, again, that's me there. I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Do you have any idea what the two olive trees represented? So here are these, here is these lampstands with bowls on them. And there's an olive tree on one side and an olive tree on another that's pouring the wine and the oil into, not the wine, but the oil into this lamp. And he says, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. There's only two types of people in the Old Testament who were anointed with oil. It was the priest and it was the king. Jesus is our high priest and our king. God said to the nation, I'm your king. They said, no, 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 God. Yeah, we know that. But, but we need a king. We need a king. We want somebody that has power and influence. A man like the other nations have. But God was the anointed king. 
All the human kings they got, except for a few of them, did a lot of damage. David came along last year. I was in Israel. And like any good person that doesn't go on a tour, I want to know where Gehenna is, or better yet, what we would call hell. Because I knew it was close by. So I started doing a little research. And I'm, I'm sitting in this, in this flat, and there's a 24-hour house of prayer above me, and I look out my back of my window, and I see the Dome of the Rock. I'm looking at the Temple Mount. And what happened was, as I began to research it, I noticed that hell was literally at my feet. The valley I walked through every morning to go into the city of Jerusalem, I was walking through the valley known as Gehenna. And it is one of the worst high places in the entire word of God. And you say, why? It's because that's where they sacrifice children. Yeah. It was the place when they came there, they had the altar to the god Melech there. And the word that they used was Tophet. And they actually found one. They uncovered one. And I um, can't remember where they uncovered it. But when they uncovered it, they found 30,000 human bones. And almost every one of them were children. And almost every one of those children were male children. The one on the left. So what happened was, good. is the kings, there were some good kings that actually destroyed that altar. But by the time you get to the king Manasseh, they're already sacrificing at it again. They rebuilt it. That's what the human kings did. Hebrews 3, 1 says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus is the high priest of your confession. But the question is, what are you confessing? Yeah. We live with a true king and priest in our life. And the Holy Spirit will take care of the rest. In Genesis 4, Cain kills Abel. And the land is cursed. Because of the blood that is spilled. In Genesis 8, Noah sees the curse reversed by obedience. And the land was completely purified by the blood. But the devil still played a major role. He was always in the details. I ministered last week on seven lessons from the tribe of Dan. Do you know the tribe of Dan is not mentioned one time in the entire New Testament? When you go read the tribes in the book of Revelation, the one that is glaringly missing is the tribe of Dan. Ephraim is not there, but Joseph is. But the tribe of Dan is completely missing. Because they were never aware of they were supposed to be. They always were walking in disobedience. They always were allowing the devil to play them. And there's people like that out there today. They allow the devil to play a major part. They could be blessed, but there's always a battle. But then the blood of Jesus was poured out and he destroyed every work of the devil. You don't have to live another day under the condemnation of the devil. You don't have to live another day under the fear of the devil. You don't have to live another day under the lie of the devil. God has sent his son who died on a cross. He can wash you in his blood, fill you with his Holy Spirit, and you are empowered to do mighty exploits for God. Amen. This is what John says. I've had many... There was a service going on not too far from here. Different town. 
pastor asked him, where were you last night? This is what the minister said. Well, you know, I was just really fighting witchcraft and, and the devil was really attacking me. I thought you've lost your ever-loving mind. He didn't even show up to preach. That was his excuse. I thought, my God, you ain't going to ever preach in my church. Of course, I don't have a church, so that's pretty easy. <laughs> this is what John says in 1 John 5, 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who has been born of God protects him. Who's the he that was born of God? Jesus. He protects the person who is now born of God. And the evil one does not touch him. Explain to me how a child of God can allow the devil to run Russia all over them and do whatever he wants. When I have the blood of Jesus, I have the name of Jesus, I have the power of the Holy Spirit. Every single thing that I need to defeat the devil has already been given to me. And if you're not walking in that, then you're missing it. Yeah. Hebrews 8 tells us that it's a better covenant with better promises. Hebrews 12 tells us that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The way I see it, you only have two options. Hebrews 10 says it like this. For if we go on sinning deliberately... After receiving a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. If you think for one second, when you receive the word of this, that I can go back to my sinful life and I can live any which way I want and God's okay with that, you're playing a game with God. You've become a Las Vegas Christian and the church is your casino. If you're sinning when you know what is right and you don't do it and you're doing it deliberately, they're no longer, Jesus' sacrifice can't even help you. But only a fearful expectation of judgment. Well, I just believe everybody goes to heaven. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? I don't know how you could read those verses right there and think, you can do whatever you want, and grace covers it. It literally says right there, if that's your mentality, you're profaning the spirit of grace. Because you know what's right, and you deliberately go against what the word of God says. And it's, a, it's, it's an outrage to the spirit of grace. The spirit of grace is not something for you to sit there and say, I can do whatever I want. Grace covers it. The only, listen... You're not saved with grace. You're saved with the blood of the Lamb. It's by grace, not with grace. Grace is an empowering in your life. God gives you grace so that you can put your foot on the throat of the devil. When you truly understand grace, you truly understand that God loves you so much that he begins to well up in his eye. Have you ever heard the term, the twinkling of an eye? You just got a sparkle in your eye. That's what the picture of grace is. That's when, this, when, when emotion so much wells up in you. I taught on this out in the tent last year. Emotion so much wells up in you that, that your, your, um, your eyes begin to fill with water and tears. And the light reflects off of them. And that's the sparkle. That's grace. That's what Jesus is looking at when the, in the Father. When they look at you, that's the kind of thing that he is so much most. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And he didn't wait for you to get right. He did it while you hated him. While we were still yet enemies of God. Jesus died for you. Or your other option is what I already said in 1 John 5, 18. That you can come to the realization that the blood of Jesus 
and the Holy Spirit over and all through your life and everything you do gives you power over everything that the devil tries to throw at you. Yeah. Does that mean he won't throw things at you? Oh no, he'll throw things at you. Because he wants you to give up. Every move of God is just simply mankind partnering with God to do what he says to do. It's very simple. It's how I can go into a restaurant at a place many would say is a defiled place. And it wasn't Hooters. It was just the... the, the it was at Disney, okay? And I can simply say to the waiter, through the unction of the Holy Spirit, I just want you to know God loves you and he has a great plan for you. And he breaks. He gets saved in about five seconds. It's that simple. Because just like I said, the Holy Spirit can anoint you to do things that you could not otherwise do on your own. Now, if you're here tonight and you know that the life you're living is not pleasing to God, you listen to everything I said and you said, you know what, I don't have that because I, I, don't, I don't have that relationship with God. You can't expect the Holy Spirit to move in your life if you're not fully surrendered to Jesus. I'm not saying he can't move in your life. I'm just saying you can't expect it. Good luck with that. Let me know how that works out for you because it didn't work out good for me. But if you're tired, sick and tired of the way life has been going and you know or maybe you just don't know what's going to happen to you I understand that every time I step forward to preach, eternity's hanging in the balance for somebody in the room. It could be your last time to ever hear this and your last time to say yes to Jesus. Or it could be the best day of your life that you finally fully surrender to Jesus and he could turn your life around in a matter of seconds and everything that seemed to be going wrong he can begin to turn it around. It might not happen overnight, but he can start the process immediately. And if you're here tonight, before we do anything else, and you don't know what would happen to you when you die, will you go to heaven? If you can't say yes to that, we can make that secure tonight. Maybe the devil's been lying to you. And telling you that you're not really saved. We can silence him tonight by the power of the blood of Jesus. And if you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven, but I don't want to leave here without knowing it 100%. I'm going to say this to you. I don't want to go to heaven without you. And if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. I just want the privilege to pray with you and for you. When the Holy Spirit begins to do something in your life, He doesn't make you a weirdo. He actually doing it to make you better. Is there anybody else that says tonight is my night and I got to make things right with God? Will you come up here, please? Not is there anybody else? God told me. I'm going to tell you to be honest because I know almost everybody in this room. God told me. He said, you're here tonight for you. I'm here tonight for you. My family, my daughters, my sons, my wife, we're here because you were here. God sent us here for you tonight. That's how much he loves you. He sent his son to this earth to die on a cross for you because he loves you so much that he wants you to go be with him. Oh, you were raising your hand? I'm sorry. Praise God. Praise God. Is there anybody
anybody else? We're going to pray a very simple prayer. You guys are just going to repeat after me. But let me tell you what's going to happen. The Bible says that peace comes with believing. If you mean business with God, God means business with you. And what will happen is, is there'll be a supernatural peace that comes into your life when you get done with this. It's a sign to you that says you really are saved. You really are on your way to heaven. Isn't it cool he does that for us? I've watched it happen time and time again. I watched it happen with people this morning in that main sanctuary right there. So I just want you to pray this prayer. Say, Father God, I come to you in the precious name of Jesus. Father, I'm sorry that I've lived my own life, that I've done my own thing, and I've run from you. But today, I'm making a 180 turn and running towards you. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you went up to heaven. And I believe right now that you're saving me. Jesus, from this day forward, I will live for only you. In Jesus' name, amen.